Everybody's How's going, everybody? Buddy. <clears throat> Hi. Hey, it's Bill Canavan, if anybody's listening. Bill. Bill. Hey, Bill. How's everybody doing? Good, good. Hi, can everybody hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. <clears throat> Linda, hey, I'm everybody. slumming till my next meeting, so I just, uh, you know, <laughs> it was either either prepare further for the police reform advisory committee or listen to this. You can see what I chose. I don't know. <laughs> Paul, I, uh, I, I just, you checking up on me? No, I just don't want to read any more about re reviewing the police. <laughs> hey, Seth, you made the right yeah. choice. I did. That was an amazing game. I was actually there again last <laughs> night. <laughs> yeah, that was fantastic. We are we talking Rangers hockey, I hope? We are talking Rangers are. hockey, Bill. Yeah, those guys are playing well. I, I I have a good feeling. I don't want to get cocky, but I think we can beat Tampa, and I think we're better than them. I, I'm not that cocky. I'm not cocky, but I think we're better. I think we're going to win it. I don't know about the cup, but we're gonna, I think we're going to beat Tampa. I'm I'm hoping I'm hoping they beat Tampa and then they play and then Edmonton somehow makes their way around Colorado, home home ice in the finals. That would be pipe dream probably, but <laughs> it's gonna be tough for Edmonton to beat Colorado, but we'll see how it goes. You never know. Never know, man. Play the game. Best yep. player in the world. Um. All right. So. Oh, what do we have here? One, two, three, four. We got four board members, so we have a quorum. Um, we do. So it's 7.04. I know uh, Nina is not going to make it. Okay. Um, is any, nobody, I'm assuming that nobody else has gotten back to you with a... No. Not it's sure possible that they they reached out to Jamie, but she's you know she's out sick. So, um. yeah, you know, um, Jaime, I don't. I think I got the notice for this meeting like two weeks ago, and then there was no reminder. So it, it might be helpful in the future if we just got reminders. Um, I, if I did send out a reminder like this afternoon. It didn't oh. come out, you know, yesterday, but yeah, it didn't come out this afternoon. Okay, so. yeah. I think you set it up as a reoccurring meeting in our calendars as well. Uh, yeah, it should have been. Um, yeah. so. Which calendar are you referring to, Bobby? Um, it's on my personal calendar, but I guess Jaime sent out a, re a reoccurring meeting because I got reminded via my calendar that this hmm. was on there. Planning board work session meeting reoccurring. Okay, I don't, I don't have that, but okay, no worries. Yeah, it's on my Gmail, like. I'm going to jump computers because I'm having, there's something, there's a new computer and it's not happy. So I will leave and All right. All right. So let's let's get into it. It doesn't look like we're going to get anybody else, um, at least for the moment. So with that, um, sorry, multiple screens now and pulling up the agenda. So all right. So we're going to start off today with uh, with Water Street. Um, so Jaime, do you want to? I mean, I wasn't at the last meeting. I don't know how, how far we got through everything, but just, I, I'm assuming we're we're kind of dealing with the Secra, you know, finishing our way or winding our way through Secra. Yeah. So the um, last meeting, we really didn't discuss it at all. It was not on the agenda, other than to let people know that we we're going to come here today and talk about it. So we, I think what we're going to try to do is just close the loop as much as possible on um, the Secra matters that we do have enough information to do that with. So we have Bill Canavan with us today. Uh, he can talk a little bit about, um, you know, his stuff, the Brownfields questions. I think hopefully, um, you know, we have enough information after the discussion with, uh, with Bill Canavan to kind of make some sense of what's going on there. Uh, we got some feedback on the traffic study. So I think that there's enough there to 
start closing that out. And uh, we had a meeting earlier this week with the fire department. So uh, they've recommended some changes. Like, uh, well, not necessarily changes, but they've recommended or they've brought up some concerns that need to be dealt with in the site plan. Um, so I don't think that the applicant's ready to move forward with any of those responses yet. Um, and we, we have a lot of detail that came in this week from SESI as well. I think it might've been last week, uh, but there hasn't been enough time to review it. And so due to the highly technical nature, it's probably not worth even evaluating at this point. Um, you know, having them present on it uh, because we just, you know, nobody's had a chance to take a look at it. Joe Tremelli hasn't had a chance to review it in depth and provide any real feedback, so. Okay, I mean, so so we have, so we can get the summary from, from Bill Canavan and I mean, we'll start, we'll, we can start there and, and kind of see see how far we can get, but it sounds like there's not too much we can go do until we review the, the new submissions. Well, so um, some of the new submissions came in earlier. Um, it was just the SESI thing that just came in the other stuff came in before your regular meeting. That's why we didn't discuss it that night because there wasn't time. But I, I think Joe has had a chance to go through some of the other things um, that have been submitted. So I think we can go through, they have submitted a fair amount of the open items that we discussed when they were on um, last month. Okay. So, yeah, we, had, um, we re reviewed the revised site plans. There was a, a water report, a sanitary report. Um, we still have yet to receive a revised SWIP, but the SWIP that we did receive and review previously was pretty, pretty well along. Um, we more recently just, uh, was it yesterday, we met with the fire chief and had some feedback from them on fire access. So they need to do a little bit of homework on their end uh, to demonstrate adequate access. Uh, so we'll need to wait and see what that's, you know, what the results of that are. And um, as Jaime mentioned, we just received, I think it was Friday, uh, a flood study. So we have not had an opportunity to look at that yet. Uh, we did meet with staff and with the applicant prior to, to that submission. So, uh, you know, we're all on the same page as to what we need and what we'll be looking for. So I expect that a lot of the information will be there. We just need to go through it. Okay. All right, so should we, should we bring them in? Uh, yes, I am having a bit of a problem with my computer trackpad not working. So if you can give me a second here. No sweat. And then I, I think we can start while we have Bill Canavan with letting Bill um, give you, you know, his, his sort of feedback on the um, remedial, remedial action work plan or, or answer any questions that board members have. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, um, it is working now. So I'm sorry, you, would you like to bring in the applicant or do you wanna have Bill talk first? I mean, I, I think it's okay to have the applicant in here. Um, we'll just, you know, okay. let, let Bill talk and that way they're there. If, you know, well, I'll, you know, as we bring the applicant in, I'll just ask that, um, you know, you're, you're there if we have any specific questions for you right now as, as Bill is speaking. Um, uh, but then after Bill's presentation um, and Q and A, we'll uh, probably you know we may have more questions for you after that. But it, I think it's fair to have them in here rather than wait till later. Okay. Get them in now. All right, Bill, do you want to get started? Sure. So that site was brought into the New York State DEC Brownfield Cleanup Program, which is a volunteer program. The owner, site owner, the volunteer would hire somebody like Sessi. Originally, they hired Arcadis. Since then, Sessi has taken over the project. They've done a ton of investigatory work there. They've done a phase one. They've done a phase two. They've done a remedial investigation, which, long story short, bunch of orange, bunch of wells. They found you know, some significant contamination, including uh, volatile organic compounds, PAHs, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons related to the old manufactured gas plant there. They assimilated all that data and they, they, they followed the Brownfield program. So the first thing they did was an RIWP, which is a real investigation work plan. 
He said, here's how we're going to investigate this after our phase one and two. And we're going to try and figure out what's going on with this site. DC. So everybody knows, and I, Joe and I had this conversation earlier. Brownfield sites are very closely scrutinized by the New York State DEC. And all matters related to soil vapor intrusion are reviewed and scrutinized by the New York State Department of Health. So now, uh, Ceci, Fouad, and his group are working with both of those regulatory agencies to take this site through the Brownfield program. So after the RIWP got approved, the Remedial Investigative Work Plan, they completed the RI, Remedial Investigation. They wrote up a comprehensive report. They said we found PAHs, we found some um, VOCs, we found some pesticides, groundwater was impacted, soil was impacted. Here's the areas of concern. Here's where it's uh, uh, impacted. So now what are we gonna do? So uh, when, when SESI took over, there was uh, on the record, it's all, it's all in, their, in their reports, it's a good report, but it's all in the report. It basically said, all right, well, there's four tracks, track one, two, three, and four in the Brownfield program. The original remedy was less, I guess for lack of a better word, invasive, stringent, et cetera. So what, what, what they did was, well, if we do that, we're not gonna be able to build these residential apartments, basements. We're not gonna be able to develop the site the way we want to. So they proposed additional work. So what's on the table now in the remedial action work plan is to, to excavate some soil, a, a lot of soil. I mean, I, I'm, I'm driving, I don't, I don't know off the top of my head, but it's thousands of yards or tons. Treat some soil in place, do some um, uh, recovery wells for what we call denapple uh, or, or napple, non aqueous phase liquid from the like, basically petroleum hydrocarbons that are sitting there under the site. And, and they're going to take it, they're going to take this site to what's called the track four pathway. And so a track four pathway will allow them the group that's trying to develop the site to implement their, their approved, DEC approved RAWP, excavate soils, treat some stuff in place, do some product recovery, do some long-term monitoring and maintenance, put a site cap in and a deed notice. It will allow them as a group, as a developer, to build the apartments, the residential set uh, setup they want to build. So all, all that stuff is, is outlined in the RWP that Sessi and Fouad and those guys put together. And it's, it's going to be reviewed and approved with, with a lot of back and forth, as Sessi and everybody else knows, with the regulatory agencies. The DOA is just going to review, Department of Health, New York State, is going to review all all matters related to the contamination that was there and the potential for soil vapor intrusion, which they've already investigated and are addressing. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. DC will approve it, DOH will approve it. Then, then they're good to go. They get it approved, they implement it. After they get their RAWP implemented and completed, they'll have to write what's called a final engineering report. That'll get approved you know, over time, once they prove they've done everything they need to, to make this site safe for human health and the environment. And then SESI, SESI in that group will, will put together what's called a site management plan, which will be uh, stuff like every quarter, every month, whatever it may be, they're going to go monitor the wells. They're going to, if, if they have any kind of ventilation for the buildings, they're going to have to prove that they're working properly that it's, you know, people can, nothing's coming into the parking lot, the basement, whatever it may be. And um, me, I told Joe this, um, the work to date is following the Brownfield program very closely. It's, it's technically sound. Um, 
they're doing a good job. And um, I think all you know, the board members should know that having done lots and lots of brownfield work, there's a lot of scrutiny by the agencies and not, things don't get approved until they're thoughtful, proven out and working. And I think that's the pathway so far that, th that this site is on from based on all the stuff I've reviewed between what Arcadis did and then Sessi took it over and what Sessi's doing. So and at the end, the end game, and I think you all know this, but I'm going to say it anyway. The end game for the volunteer is, okay, I'm going to do all this work. I'm going to Uh, you're breaking up just as you're getting to that great point. Yeah. <laughs> My engineering and geology people. We we I'm lost do what you they at tell me. Gonna, we we lost you at no, end so game. so for the volunteer is to come. All right, so can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Everybody hear me now? Okay, so I'll I'll just repeat what I said. The, the, and, and we lost you again. Zoom, the Zoom gods don't want you to make this point. <laughs> Bill, can you hear us? Bill, are you there? All right. Um, Looks like we've walked for a moment. For the bomb. Bill, Bill, we're not we're not making out any of this. Um you're 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 not yeah, I think we have just officially lost you. All right. I actually have a few questions, several questions coming out of this. Um so I don't know if we can give him a moment to come back in. It sounds like he was in transit. Um I don't know if if Joe, if you'd be able to kind of answer some of some of them are, are probably pretty basic. Um, but uh, you know, as he's coming back well, in, we do have Rich Williams here. And okay. so Rich Williams might be able to help out with some of this. And so Jim, I think uh, is it is it you and Rich that are kind of leading up the brownfield stuff? Sure. Well, we could take we could take a pass at whatever question you have. Sure. And and some of these are really just basic in terms of like the brownfield. You know, process in general, and and just understanding, you know, as a board, differentiating the different the different tracks, and um, and so, I, which was really, I think, my first question is just kind of really understanding the difference between you know one, two, three, and four. Understanding that the track four is needed. Sounds like the track four is needed in order to to um, develop you know the residential program yeah. that you, that you have there. Um, so, I mean, that that's part one of a question. Then part two, just to kind of let, let you speak a little bit, and and it looks like Bill is here. And if if, if Bill, you can hear us, um, you know, you can chime in as well. Uh, just is after the you know once the process gets started. And I think we talked about this in a recent brownfield that we were looking at. Is you know if you're starting off on a track four, you know what's you know what's are, you know is there any chance that at, you know as the project starts or as the remediation starts. Um, that you know found conditions on the site would would change that to a you know to a, a lesser track, um, and if so, you know what are the remedies? You know what you know that that's that. Those, I mean, those, those are the two portion the two questions that I have right now. You know, off the bat. Bill, do you want me to answer that, or do you want to answer that? Bill, Bill, can you hear us? Are you there? Why, why, why don't you why don't you go ahead sure uh, so so um typically tracks residential tracks are one two and four one is the most clean you're basically getting to virgin soil two is the next level of clean and four is the least clean so it's the opposite of what you kind of just said got it we, we know based on the contamination on the site and based on what's going to be left in place that you, we're, nobody could achieve a track one or track two so this is called a track four restricted residential um Arcadius was not our consultant. It was the consultant of Con Ed. So we, we, take, we took all their reports and married them with new information that SESI has put together. So our remedial action work plan takes all of Arcadius reports and adds to it to allow us to get to a track four restricted residential. 
in, in brownfield jobs, you could go in with a track one, track two, track four, and it could change based on the level of contamination you find. You know, an engineer might tell you you have to go down 20 feet, you go down 20 feet, you take endpoint samples, and you're still not at track one or track two, so you keep chasing it, or you make a business decision not to. We know going in pretty clearly based on the level of contamination on this site and on based on what the contamination is, track four is the ultimate outcome. Got it. That, that's very helpful. Um, I, you know, I, I just maybe related to this, but also just kind of, under, and this is maybe more of a bill question, but it would be helpful just to understand the, the impact of the, the water course on the site and, and how that relates to the remediation and how that, you know, whether, how that complicates it, whether, whether there's any, you know, what's the impact of the, um, the existing site conditions on that water, um, it, realizing that's, that's moving through and, and we're trying to, you know, clean the site up. That, that was just, I, I don't know if there's any specific steps that are going to be taken with regard to the waterway. Well, we'll have to do dewatering because of where the water table is. And Rich, you're probably better equipped than me to answer that question. I mean, I know we're going to have to do dewatering. I don't know specifically any other information related to that question. Do you? Rich? Uh, yeah, it's, it's I mean, as part of any of the site work that we're going to be doing, remediation or other, we're going to have to prepare an erosion sediment control plan. It'll meet the New York State standards and specifications for erosion sediment control. Um, you know, and, and, and Joe, Joe can, uh, Joe will be reviewing that and seeing, making sure it meets all those requirements, but it'll typically include things like construction entrances to prevent tracking of mud, proper dewatering plans, how to dewater, um, sill fence. Um, and other protective barriers to make sure that we keep sediment and any of the, the materials that we're working with out of the kill, protect the kill through construction. And we're, and we're not required to kill, uh, to, to remediate the kill, and the kill is not part of the brownfield site because it doesn't have uh, the level of contamination required to. Thanks. Yeah, no, that's an also another important point. Um, but I'm assuming that's, that was tested as part of all, of, as part of your initial um, your remedial investigation was was looking at the kill itself. Yeah, and that's addressed in the wrap too. Board members. Yeah, I have one question. Um, since it's going to be a track board, which is considered the dirtiest of the soils, um, what kind of ongoing monitoring is going on once you have restricted residential in house to make sure that the drinking water is safe for all the residents there? Ceci will. Uh, our environmental engineer will be required to there'll be on-site monitoring wells and they'll be required to monitor them. I'm not sure if it's monthly or quarterly and then submit reports to Department of Health and to DEC and they have to approve each of the reports. Um, so it's similar to what the ongoing monitoring that's done at Harbor Square right now and Ceci's the engineer on that job as well. Got it. And that just goes on in, ter in perpetuity, right? For as long as the site's there? Yep. Okay. Yep. You know what track... Uh... Harbor Square was by any chance? I don't, but I'm assuming because of the ISS in place that they did as well, it has to be a track four. I, I don't know of any manufactured gas plant site, former manufactured gas plant site that would achieve, that has achieved a track one or track two. Not that it's fully relevant, but just to understand kind of history in the village, it would be helpful to get that just kind of confirmed. I mean, I don't know if there's, I'm sure we can look at um, yes. and do that. I mean, I'll take it. Would you like me to explain it or would you like me to look into whether other manufacturing gas plants are? Is that, I'm trying to understand the question. I, just to, to look at Harbor Square and, and any other, you know, I, I can think of any other large scale recent developments in that area. Um, but yeah, it, it, any other brownfields in that in that area. And, and it, you know, I know the last one we looked at. Um, I'm going to defer to Linda. She's taking more. herself off of mute and she probably has more familiarity with this kind of food. Yeah, no, I think is, is the question just you want to know what track Harbor Square was. That's correct. And and if there are any other track fours, um, you know, in the last, I'd say, you know, let's call it 10 years in the village. And, and Linda and Jaime, I could I could email for I didn't get an answer of specifically the Harbor Square and flip it to you guys if you want. Uh, yeah, that'd be helpful. I know uh, Tony did that as well, I think, right? So, yeah, or at least Sassy did. Same, same Tim, do you have anybody from Sassy here with you tonight? They, they were the engineers on same team. Square. I don't know. I, I will next time. I, I didn't realize we were going to, it's my fault. No, I don't, unfortunately. No, that's fine. Just uh, might've been an easy ask. 
And, yeah. and what, what it, it would have been an easy ask. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get X's on the sheet, Joe. Yep. Yeah. And, and related to Bobby's question, you know, what is what's the enforcement mechanism for that ongoing monitoring? It's a New York State program. Is there like an, an annual you know, report that needs to be issued, or how is that? How is that managed? Yeah, it, yeah. It's either it's either. Um, I think it's quarterly. I'll confirm that. But there is certainly um, a report that is required to go to DEC and DOH that is reviewed and commented on. Just and one thing following up. Right? I'm oh, sorry, Linda. I'm sorry. Just following up because Bobby's comment um, asked about the drinking water and impact on the drinking water. There are, this is not, um, groundwater is not used for drinking water here. So that's not that that would be that that would change everything. <laughs> yeah. right. So do you, um, you guys can you guys hear me? I think I'm back on. Oh, Canada. we can now. Hi, Bill. Yes. Sorry, I'm guys. I, I'm driving, but I heard a bunch of what you guys were saying, and uh, if whenever it's appropriate, I'll, I can finish my thought that you guys didn't hear. You can correct all of us now. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I didn't. Well. Only, only you, Joe. You deserve uh, correct. Always. Yeah, Bill doesn't like to correct me. You, we, you, we were on the edge of our seats. You, you said, <laughs> the, the, the so, so, so what I was trying to say was the end game for the volunteer is to get approval of the FER, the site management plan, and then get their certificate of completion, which will allow them within the Brownfield program to develop the site, receive the reimbursements and tax credits from the state. And depending on the track, and as you guys already discussed, this is a track four site. Um, a track four site is the least stringent. It's, it's uh, someone, someone made the good point earlier that a site like this is typically not a track one site because it's really difficult to get to clean. I actually have seen sites like this get to clean, but this is probably not one of them. And um, after all those all those things are in place and approved, the FER is approved, the SMP is approved, they'll get their COC and they'll be responsible. And I heard you guys talking, um, it's likely gonna be quarterly monitoring, sampling, et cetera. And maybe depending on what they have there for the residential setting, um, monthly site visits to make sure, for example, a sub slab depressurization system or something like that, a ventilation system is working properly. So uh, I don't know if you, you guys still hear me. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, and then somebody, um, somebody brought up another good point. I don't know who it was about offsite impacts, et cetera. In the Brownfield program, as a volunteer, you're not responsible for offsite contamination. If it exists, you're only responsible for keeping your own site from going offsite. So example, if, if, you, if you have tetrachloroethylene on your site, and it's causing soil vapor issues, then you're, you're gonna be responsible to put in the, the proper controls guys like SESI would design and do. But if there's contamination that's already gone off site, you're, you're not gonna to have to mitigate it. That's how, that's how the Brownfield program works. And that's how, what it's designed to do. So somebody, I think somebody was talking about the stream there, the kill, um, and it looks like from what I've seen, given the constituents of concern, they're all, they're, they're not, they're not very soluble and they're not the kind of things that are going to, that are going to migrate uh, great distances, like something like MTBE, right? Methyl, methyl tertiary butyl ether, gasoline additive. So in this case, it's likely that everything that they're dealing with is going to be on site and it's all outlined in their RAWP with where they're gonna excavate. I think it's like three or four areas where they're gonna treat in situ in place and then where they're gonna drill wells uh, to collect free phase product that they observed and um, where they're gonna just drill wells to monitor just to make sure, uh, I forget which board member brought it up, but just to make sure 
nothing's going to leave, you know, is leaving sight. So, you know, I was trying to emphasize to the group, them being in the Brownfield program, they have so many hoops to jump through outside the town, you know, not you know, the, the building department in town, you guys, the zoning board, et cetera. They're all outside of this program where it's an exhaustive, detailed progression towards getting your COC. So that, I, that's, that's what I was trying to say earlier when I, I got cut off driving. Very helpful. Um, with that COC, is that issued after completion of construction or is that after completion of remediation during the site work? Well, that's a great question. It can be both. By that, I mean, if the, the volunteer and, and, and their consultant, Ceci, say, for example, we want to we wanna start construction on the first building and they prove to the DOH in terms of soil vapor and to the DEC that what they're doing on that section of the site is protective of human health and the environment, then they can simultaneously go about their business, do their construction, while at the same time complying with the Brownfield program. So I, I'll, I'll give you the example. I, was, I had this discussion with Joe earlier today. The example I'll give is the site we have in Tuckahoe where Sessie actually did the uh, storm water. And so that site was way worse than this site. I'll just say that. But what we did was we approached it in phases and they actually were able to build the hotel, a hotel, because we, we, we put in a site-wide cap, we put in a sub-slab depressurization system and we drilled a bunch of wells and borings and so on. And we step-by-step step confirmed and proved to the New York State DEC and the New York State DOH that that particular section of the site was, was set and safe to build a hotel. So that, that, that is an approach. You can do both kind of simultaneously. But at times, depending on the site, we have a site in Yonkers. We didn't do that. We basically said, we're cleaning this up, track one here, track two there. We're done. You know, you see what you guys think, approve it, which they did. And now it's, it's set. It's going to be built on. It has not been built yet. But the other site that I'm referencing, just to try and explain it to everybody, it was a long term. It was a five year, six year site. So the, the volunteer and a developer you know, working with the state and the DOH, the DEC and the DOH, I mean, um, basically we took it to, to that pathway of, all right, we're going to focus on getting this hotel built because we need to make the site worthwhile and generate some income. And then the rest of the site, which we're doing now, is going to be progressively cleaned up as we move north. So th that could be an approach here for them if they wanted to. And then at the same time, all through that whole process, you guys, the, the town, the village has all the say in like, all right, well, you know, you, you, you got to meet building code. You can only build a three-story building. You can't build a five-story building. So all that was subject to village approval to comply with zoning and building code. So that's where, you know, the village, the town of Austin's jurisdiction would be like, all right, well, you know, you got to use this sheet rock, you got to use this roofing material, you got to do this fire protection and so on. And that's all like, as if I was just sending you guys an application to build a house or a commercial building, I would deal with the fire department, the building department and so on. But under the Brownfield program, from the ground down, so to speak, is under the the scrutiny and jurisdiction of the New York State DC mostly, and then to a lesser extent, the DOH as it relates to soil vapor. 
I'll just add, Seth, if I can, what Bill just described is what we've done on all of our brownfield sites, which is go vertical after while we obtain the COC. That's always the goal. You know, it depends on site. You know, it depends on how the cleanup's going. But typically, we'll get the COC while we're building vertically. Yep. Um, just one other question on this particular site, and and I, you know, this may be just a, a timing question, but I know that the that the final lot configuration is a little bit different from the current lot configuration. The the confines of the brownfield site are those on on both the uh, on kind of both portions of of the property right now, um, and, and and I'm assuming that that brownfield process then kind of happens. And, and this may, Jaime, this may even be a question for you, just as far as you know, when that property gets kind of subdivided out and, and, and how that relates to the brownfield process. Uh, I don't think they're doing any work on the part of the property that's going to be uh, the village's property. I think all their work is going to be essentially around the footprint of the buildings. Is that correct? Yeah, we don't expect contamination on the, on the village's part, but we are going to test while we're out there. And if, if there is with all the woods and trees, what it likely would be would, would just put a cover on top, um, but we don't expect to run into any contamination there. It's just, it hasn't been tested yet. When will that testing happen? After we're in the program and we, we get started out there. So typically once you make application, it takes 90 to 120 days to get to a fully executed Brownfield cleanup agreement. And we're- I'm sorry? 90 to 120 days from when you make application. So, Jim, in a, in a, I guess, a worst case scenario, <clears throat> scenario, if you did test on the portion that's going to be remain with the village and there was contamination and you did cap it or, you know, get it to whatever track, would the village then be responsible for the long term maintenance of any systems or, or monitoring? I guess, how would that work? You know, I have to I have to check and read the access agreement. Um, I think it would still be with us as because we're the, we're the volunteer in the program, but I will check that and get back to you. So was that Joe that asked that question? Yeah, I'm trying to impress you, Bill. You are. You're impressed. You always impress me, Joe. <laughs> so the village, the volunteer, and the site owner has all responsibility to comply with the site management plan in the confines of the Brownfield program. So the village has no responsibility, no liability, unless the village is actually the owner and the applicant in the process. We're gonna be the owner uh, of our side of the property, I think in perpetuity, they'll never be the owner of that side of the property. I think they have an access easement or an access agreement to build on our side, which is going to become a park, um, but they'll technically never really be owner of that portion of the property. All right. So if the village is not the owner and not, not the applicant in the volunteer program, the BCP program, then they, they're not going to have any, any responsibility to maintain systems, uh, monitor groundwater, monitor soil, et cetera. Yeah, because they're not a party to the applicant. That's right. It would be on us. Okay. Any other questions or thoughts from the board? I think this was, I think, very, very helpful. Um, very descriptive. Um, I, you know what? Where else are we right now? And I and I, I think if, you know, if we don't have any other questions from the board on this topic, I think we can maybe excuse. Um, do, do we need Bill for anything else on, on this, Jaime? Yeah. So, uh, Bill, thank you very much. This was uh, very very helpful. Um, I know this is a, a relatively new, I think, for most members on this board, um, and and a, um, obviously a big part of this. Yeah, no problem. I'm I'm happy to help and. Um... You know, I can be reached on email and phone and, you know, Joe's got my info and I'm always happy to help. Excellent. Thank you. All right, have, have a good Thanks, night, Bill. all. You too. You're welcome. Take care. Thanks, Bill. You're welcome. Bye-bye. All right. So, Jaime, where, where, where are we uh, next with this? Uh, I, I know um, we had a couple other. Yeah, so we have, a, we have a bunch of stuff here to cover. Uh, I think probably the first thing to do is to go to Joe. He has 
a couple of um, memos that he uh, was able to get to us today, but hasn't gotten out to y'all. So I think it's a good opportunity to talk about those to try to um, close the loop on some of those items. And, and uh, I'm assuming we're gonna talk a little bit about the wetland stuff, uh, some other items. And then uh, I think the traffic study, we do not have Mr. Greeley here from Collier's Engineering, um, but I, I'm hopeful that Mr. Canning will be able to, uh, between Mr. Canning and Mr. Chimelli, we'll be able to get through uh, most of the comments since the memo basically states that there are, that all his comments were satisfied. Um, that right, Joe, Jeff. do you want to take over? Sure. So uh, we had prepared two memos previously and, and uh, Today we issued uh, basically a just update to each of those memos. The first of which was regarding bulk zoning compliance and the need for various variances. Uh, they've they haven't changed since the prior application. They've actually been reduced slightly. The new configuration of the lots with the two lot subdivision uh, eliminated the need for variances such as uh, building width and, and view sheds. Uh, so I, they've. The reconfiguration has reduced the, the total number of variances needed. The plans that Insight had prepared um, did a great job of summarizing the required variances in their bulk zoning compliance table. Uh, our memo simply, I think for the most part, summarizes that for the board. Uh, I did speak with Joe Gastinelli earlier this week. I know he was in the process of trying to prepare the um, referral form. I, I don't know offhand if that's been finalized yet or not uh it has we, been finalized yeah it it has or has not yeah it has yeah it was finalized. okay yesterday. all right great so uh i think as far as the area variances go we you know we're all in agreement with what is needed um i don't know that we need to go through each one now um they're all you know like i said they're identified in my memo they're identified in the plans um you know i'll leave it to you if you want to yeah, no, no. I mean, if, if you have it written, that's fine. I think that my question would be um, in at our next meeting is that these are referrals that we would need to make to ZBA. Are we at a point? I may mean, read. You already um, did it. We already made that. All right. <laughs> then, uh, but if they've changed, okay. And if they've, they've but they've only lessened. So I guess some of the referrals right. that we made are no longer relevant. Yeah. yeah. So right. the, the, the two things that we did do at the meeting last week were um, tell them to go to the ZBA and the EAC. Excellent. Very good. And I know ZBA cannot vote until um, we have a you know, secret resolution. So. Right, but we have asked them to give you any input um, for secret. Perfect, perfect, thank you. All right, sorry about that, Jeff. You no problem. Uh, so the, the second memo was related to more of the, the site components and the engineering. Uh, and just, uh, I guess I could, I'll go through it and touch on some of the, the main points here. Uh, you know, as, as was mentioned, there's going to be some access and maintenance agreements that are going to be needed for uh, the access to the village parcel, to the walkway, uh, to the uh, stormwater maintenance, or uh, I guess stream maintenance features. Uh, all those easements and access roads and whatnot need to be finalized yet. Uh, we've been working with the applicant uh, with Insight and with SESI uh, to, you know, come up and, and get those, those details for those in-stream features. Uh, worked out and, and that's continuing. Um, hey Joe, yep. I've been working on drafting those and okay. drafting the document that outlines the easements. So you might want to touch base with me too. Sure. Uh, let's see. We, as I mentioned earlier, we just had a meeting with the fire department with the, the chief uh, yesterday and with staff. Uh, as well as with the applicant to um, discuss um, potential modifications to the plan to address adequate fire access. Uh, first conversation we had with the fire department. So, you know, it was kind of a, a sounding board opportunity for everybody. Uh, you know, Rich and the architect, project architect, went away with a little bit of homework. Uh, they're going to be providing uh, the fire department with additional information, turning movements, uh, fire access routes and whatnot, uh, just to demonstrate that the site will provide adequate access. Uh, and, and Rich, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. I, I imagine you probably haven't even, I don't even think you received the specifications on the 
fire apparatus yet. So uh, I, you probably haven't been able to do much of anything since we spoke, but I don't know if there's anything you want to add on that point. Yeah, I mean, um, we took a quick look after our conversation yesterday, um, depending on what the specs from the fire truck show and how much room they need for outriggers, there may be more access than I think we were assuming in that meeting. Um, from the area next to the parking garage. Um, I think from a seeker standpoint, what we're really talking about, you know, from a big picture and impacts is, you know, how the crossing is made across the kill um, and how that looks. And, you know, I don't think there's going to be any substantial modifications. I think maybe, you know, we end up in a solution where it shifts slightly from its current location, the elevation changes based on some of the floodplain analysis and potentially it's skewed a little bit just to better position with the fire trucks. But, uh, we can go through those analyses. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, so just, you know, again, from a secret standpoint and determining, you know, that there will be adequate fire access. We did have this meeting. Um, Rich, I think you're saying you think that you can pretty easily address their concerns and show them that there's adequate access. Yes, I, you know, that's what we're looking at now. Again, to Joe's point, we do need to see the specs and confirm some things. Um, but, you know, as far as the, what we were talking about yesterday, which is making sure the aerial apparatus can reach, you know, the seventh and eighth floors, as well as the other floors in the building, I, I, we're hopeful that once we get those specs, they're going to confirm what we're thinking and it'll be something we can demonstrate pretty easily. Linda, is that a possible condition um, if those specs aren't worked out by the time we're ready to resolve the other secret issues? I, I'm, I'm thinking that um, they'll be worked out within the next week or two. Okay, perfect. I have faith in Rich. Yeah. <laughs> no comment, Rich. <laughs> Sounds good. Joe? Uh, the, ne the next few comments are related to the, the floodplain impact and uh, the flood study that uh, was just submitted. So, um, you know, in, in speaking with Ceci uh, prior to the submission, they've um, prepared us a flood study, a heck grass analysis to demonstrate no rise in the floodway um, and no net loss of storage in the floodplain as a result of the development. Uh, one, one of the, uh, obviously, you know, we'll be reviewing that just to, to make sure we're in agreement, but based on the, the preliminary conversations we had and, and the kind of staff level preliminary review, uh, I would expect that to be the case. Uh, one question that we did have uh, as a result of that meeting, the, the mixed use building is a little bit of a, uh, a nuance uh, as far as the, the lower level parking garage and the uh, kind of the, the bathtub situation that that creates. And we had questioned the ability to have that lower level access. Uh, since then, we've, um, speaking with SESI, uh, some FEMA technical guidelines and uh, I guess reports uh, were reviewed, and it seems that the as long as that lower level garage is designed uh, as a basically a reverse bathtub to keep the the water out, you know, designed to withstand the hydrostatic forces, uh, the driveway entry as already designed will provide a uh, I guess a, a berm for lack of a better description to prevent flood waters from entering the garage from from the ground level. Uh, you know, it seems as though as long as all of those provisions are, are um, dealt with, that that lower level garage, because it is just a parking garage and access to the building would be permitted uh, within the floodplain and below the floodplain elevation. Uh, they'll, they'll need to design some, um, you know, into their mechanical systems, make sure that the utilities are above the floodplain elevation, uh, probably have some kind of uh, pump system that if there were you know, any opportunity for floodwaters to enter that building for whatever reason, that those waters could be evacuated. And th those will all, you know, those de design details will come later on. I'm sure those could all be dealt with as conditions, but, um, you know, one, once we get through the flood study itself and can confirm that there is no impact, I think that as far as secret is concerned, we can close that loop. Can, can I just ask a question that we don't have Bill here anymore, of course, but just as far as the, the, um, the brownfield, Clean up and having a, you know this subgrade you know basement that's going to be designed effectively to flood. Um, is there any interaction there between it, you know you know any you know, vent wells or I, I don't know if there's any infrastructure in the basement that would be related to the to the brownfield cleanup 
that would be impacted by the flooding that would need to be mitigated somehow? Well, the, the, actually, the, the lower level, the garage level, would be designed to prohibit any entry of floodwaters whatsoever. So, uh, you know, it'll be a completely uh, basically. Uh, I, hold on, Joe. I just I wanted yeah. to follow up that question. Rich, can you chime in on this? I, I thought that the I thought that the basement floor was actually going to allow water intrusion back and forth. And so, can you clarify what's going on on that on that bottom floor under the residential building? Sure. So we had talked about as part of doing the floodplain analysis, the potential if we needed it, um, using the basin for additional flood volume storage. Uh, when SESI actually ran the modeling, it turns out that we did not need the additional storage. Um, so from a building ownership standpoint, from safety standpoint, from property damage insurance, it's much more beneficial to not design the basement to flood. Um, Again, when we were talking originally, it was, we left the option open because we hadn't yet completed the floodplain modeling. And if the floodplain modeling had shown an increase in flooding as a result of the development, we would have need to offset that with additional storage. It turns out we did not need the additional storage um, between the existing building on the site and the additional stormwater uh, improvements we're making, as well as uh, you know, Sesti's running of the model and the piers and everything else. It turns out that the flood elevations don't don't rise. So we don't need the additional storage in the basement. Got it. Okay. okay. Sorry about that, Jeff. No problem. Uh, the next uh, item in our memo was related to the slope stabilization measures, retaining walls. Uh, we did receive a conceptual plan that uh, identified the locations and types of the various retaining walls. It's a precast modular block system uh, proposed for the retaining walls. The, uh, the steep embankment to the, uh, to the south uh, is proposed to be, uh, all vegetation was proposed to be removed. And then the, uh, you know, loose, any loose debris, loose rock would be removed from that, that face, that rock face, and then ultimately protected with a wire mesh netting. Uh, and then the, the lower level, uh, the toe of that slope will be planted with a, a meadow mix is currently proposed. Uh, you know, whether or not, uh, you know, obviously we'll, we'll need more detail on that as the plans develop. Uh, from a seeker standpoint, I, I would think you have enough to evaluate what that will, will look like, uh, what that uh, end result will be. Um, Linda, I may, if you correct me if you you know, disagree with that, but um, I think I think as far as Seeker's concerned, we're in a pretty good place in that regard. I think they've provided you know much more information than we had um, previously. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So um, next comments related to the uh, the Greenway Trail. Obviously, as the the plans develop. You know, it's shown the locations generally shown on the plan. We'll, we'll obviously need design details and profiles and and uh, more construction related information as the plans develop. Um, we do have a landscape plan for your consideration, the board's consideration. Uh, I imagine I may would be having the village arborist look at that as well, uh, in addition to their tree removal plan. We do have a lighting plan. Uh, we did take a look at it, the, the lighting appears adequate to us. Uh, it's, it's really limited to the immediate perimeter of the buildings and the, the promenade area along the kill. Um, you know, no offsite light shed. Uh, with that site, it's not surprising. Everybody, above, you know, surrounding them is above them and, and won't be impacted by the, the lighting of the site. So we see no issue with that. No up lighting or anything? No. Uh, it's a lot of, uh, you know, wall sconces, some uh, site uh, bothered lighting, uh, light fixtures within the, the kill, the area of the kill. No lighting on the trailway itself. That will be, uh, you know, as is currently, there is no lighting on that trail. And that'll continue. The next few comments are related to the water and sewer. Uh, we've, um, the applicants worked with the village water department. They've gotten uh, pressure and flow readings previously. Uh, 
demonstrating that they have adequate flow and pressure for both domestic and fire water supply. Um, I believe, Rich, you were waiting for uh, maybe more recent data to just further confirm that, but I don't anticipate any issues whatsoever with regard to water. It would be a privately owned service um, you know, so that the health department would have uh, no review authority for it. Um, it, would, it would be you know, private service connected to a village, existing village main. The, um, the sanitary sewer, uh, the health department will be reviewing it simply because of the quantity of flow from the project. It will, I expect, uh, as does Rich, you know, we expect that it'll be maintained as a private service connection uh, connected to the village main, again, in Water Street. Um, so no need for any easements, uh, no need for village ownership or maintenance, but obviously we'll, uh, we'll wait to hear back from the health department on that. But um, I'm fairly confident that, they would, that it would, would remain as a private service uh, for the project. Uh, Rich, you haven't had any further conversation with the health department in that regard, have you? Um, no, typically we wouldn't, uh, you know, this really in the process, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, they just regulate the service connection as a main due to flow and it's a, it's a village owned main and water street. So they don't have jurisdiction over it. Right. Okay. Um, we do have a few comments on the SWIP that was provided, but as I said earlier, the, the SWIP itself is in, uh, really good condition at this point. It's, um, really some technical details on some of the sizing of the, the storm lines, uh, the details of construction for the proposed green roof. So um, again, for, I think from a seeker standpoint, we have enough from a stormwater management and mitigation standpoint to uh, you know, make a determination. The, the remaining comments I have relative to the SWIP and the, the notice of intent that they'll need to file for coverage with the state uh, I, th I think could certainly be addressed later on in the process. Let's see. I think the last, or one of the last comments is related to the construction logistics plan. Um, we did receive in the last submission a, uh, a plan sheet that identified various staging areas, um, access, construction access routes. Uh, it, it identified projected timelines for various phases of work, uh, identified areas of on-street parking that would be lost temporarily during construction, uh, certain sections of uh, the, the surrounding streets that would need to have limited access for construction of various off-site improvements. Um, I think it would be helpful for the board if we had a little bit of a narrative report to go along with that figure to explain some of the um, some of the, the construction processes, timing. You know, we still need things like hours of operation, uh, temporary site lighting, security. Uh, it'd be nice to know um, if there are any proposed provisions to make up for the lost parking, temporary lost parking along Central Avenue, uh, Water Street. Uh, also, um, when the sidewalk construction, for instance, on Snowden Avenue is underway, the, you know, how do we handle pedestrian access through the, you know, along the construction site? Um, the sidewalk on the opposite side of Snowden uh, does not extend all the way up the road. It stops just as you, um, I think, get to the end of your site. So at some point, you know, we'll need to figure out how, how we deal with pedestrians walking from, say, the station up towards uh, Broadway and, and, and Highland. So, uh, you know, it's spelled out in the memo, but, you know, I think details like that would be very helpful for the board. Uh, I think it would also be nice. I know you do have timelines or durations for the various phases for both the garage and the residential building. Um, it'd be nice to maybe have it in some form of a, maybe a, a schedule or a Gantt chart, just so we could see how each site uh, plays with one another. I know you're, for instance, you're using the parking garage site as a staging area for the residential building, I imagine. Uh, but at some point, you're gonna wanna build that garage and then you know, what happens with the staging and where would that end up moving for 
whatever balance of construction. So I think things like that, they could just be explained a little bit in a report uh, that would certainly help. We could do that. Uh, let's see. Bear with me one second. Um, as far as the, let's see. So we talked about water, we talked about wastewater, storm water. Um, as far as wetlands are concerned, we did, um, we did confirm the wetland boundaries. It is a water course with a 50 foot uh, regulated buffer. Uh, there was a conceptual wetland mitigation plan that we had reviewed with, uh, with the team. Uh, we did have some comment. They have resubmitted a revised plan uh, addressing our initial, um, I guess, comments. Uh, they, their remediation or mitigation uh, consists of um, the brownfield cleanup for one, which is a, a major component of the mitigation. The enhancements in, within the stream of the kill, uh, native plantings, and the um, distilling basin and the, uh, I guess, diffusers, the energy diffusers, uh, you know, all go towards the, the wetland mitigation. So, you know, we're in general agreement with the plan. Obviously, we'll need some, some further detail, uh, you know, species, size, locations, um, any kind of monitoring and maintenance requirements for the various plant things. But um, I think the concept plan, as, as we currently have it, um, you know, addressed our initial comment. Uh, I'm wondering, it's a pretty short plan. I'm wondering if it makes sense to have Bonnie just quickly go over um, the plan for the board. Uh, sure. They may not have had much time to take a look at it. It hasn't been spoken about at this point. So Bonnie, do you want to? Yeah, I think that that's really, that's it for as far as my memo is concerned. So um, good time to go through that if you want. Perfect. Sounds good. Well, um... I so say, Joe, hit the highlights of it. Do you have it there to actually show it? Is that what you'd like to do? Uh, I do have it. Would you like me to show it? Yeah. Sure. Uh, Bonnie Von Olsen from Kimberly Horn, for those who don't know me. Um, our wetland experts put together the concept plan. And as Joe said, met, met with uh, his firm and, and Jan um, has also been you know, corresponding with the Army Corps and DEC to make sure that what was regulated and not, and it's really regulated locally. Um, and so that's really what the basis of this concept is. And uh, yeah, the first couple of pages really just talk about the, um, the regulated areas. So, to, to identify these symbols, basically the red and pink are, you know, development areas, development in previously disturbed areas and development in undisturbed areas. And as you know, the site has um, got quite a bit of disturbed areas. And it looks like a bit of a puzzle there, but uh, then the green areas are the mitigation areas. So everything that's in a color is what's, what's regulated and is going to be site improvements. So the blue obviously is the, the Sing Sing Kill itself. And then a 50 foot buffer on either side, you can see the limit of disturbance is what makes this odd shape. And then this is the trail at the top going off into the existing trail. So as you can see the, the hatch, the orange hatch is the development in previously, uh, previously disturbed areas and the undisturbed area, so where it was right now currently is, it's not pavement, it's, it's wooded. And then plantings, as you can see, you know, reflect the plan that you've seen and all along the stream, um, the stream improvements. And then the rest of it, you can see where the, the limits of disturbance, it really is just showing, <laughs> I feel like I'm not explaining this well, but the area of disturbance down here at the bottom part of the site where the building and the parking garage are going. And then the Sing Sing Kill with its uh, pedestrian crossing here, plantings along the side. The continuation of the trailway is the linear feature 
distilling basin is in this area. And what am I forgetting? The stilling basin, the plantings, the brown field remediation. I think just, the stilling basin is right here. Orange area. Yeah. Yeah. Right here. And Bonnie, just to just to add some numbers to that. Um, essentially, the areas in red equate to about 0 0.82 acres of disturbance mm -hmm. in areas that are previously previously disturbed or undisturbed areas of the buffer. And when you quantify the areas of mitigation, which is Bonnie said of the planting stream improvements in Brownfield, we have about 1.67 acres of mitigation, which um, okay. is more than two to one. Right. So it's it's the two right. to one, and that does not even count for um, you know the other beneficial impacts in terms of the entire site being, you know, now pedestrian friendly and the water quality should be improved um, over the existing condition. The flood conditions should be improved. The water is going to be slowed down with the stilling basin. So um, all of those put together make it a beneficial uh, result. And the, the table that goes, the numbers, if you go to the page before this, um, and it's also in the EAF report. That's the same table with the colors, has the numbers that, that go with each of those colors. So as, as Rich just said, 0.82 acres of development in the buffer and the mitigation is twice that, so. As Joe said, we can, we can provide obviously more detail on the actual landscape species and, and things like that as we get closer. And I know it's come up in here before, just as far as that stilling basin is concerned, we keep talking about it. Is that, that's, you fabricate that, that's that's built by digging out and just kind of creating a more standing water there to slow the water down as it comes down. How's that constructed? Right. And, and it would be stabilized obviously on the sides. Um, and as the, uh, the piers, I don't know, Rich, if you want to describe how the piers would actually work. Sure. Um, so, so working in concert with, with Paul and Joe, um, this, the, the piers in conjunction with the stilling basin or stormwater feature um, are designed to kind of react to what's been problematic with the site as far as flooding. So it, there's been a first flush that comes down through the kill. And uh, unfortunately, the first place that there's an opportunity for that to get stopped is at the Water Street culvert. So large branches, debris quickly clog the culvert, causing a damming effect, which then fails onto the existing DPW site. Um, the strategy with this is to create a stilling basin, and as Mr. Chairman, you described, come off the side of the kill, excavate you know, a, a deeper area than the kill while we leave the kill in place, and then essentially break that last piece of thin soil out so that the kill can flood into the lower lower basin that we create, which will be stabilized and won't be exposed there, so it'll likely be a riprap. And then in concert, angle piers across the kill, which will act as debris catchers. So as that first flush comes down, we're, we're catching that debris in an area where there is a much higher um, elevations or available elevations to dam the water in the event you get a branch or a stick or something that comes down and clocks. And then it would be able to pass through the piers and down through the site and under the culvert. And, and how are those piers maintained? Is there, you know, as you know, I, I imagine if they work properly, there's all sorts of debris kind of gets stuck after several storms. How is, is there a, a, a maintenance plan? How does that work? The, the village has agreed to maintain those piers, um, recognizing that I think it'll be a, a vast improvement over the uh, existing conditions. And you heard Joe mention earlier the need to work out easements and access um, that he was referring to how we're actually going to make suitable access um, for the village to get back to maintain these areas. And that's something we're confident we can accommodate. We just got to get it on the plans. So if, if you, Jaime, if you could go back to the plan for just a minute on the next page. So just to point out the piers, you know, are going to be in the basin up here. So the water is going to come down. And as Rich said, instead of um, accumulating at the very southern end there by the by the road and by the buildings, it's, it would get filtered up here and uh, removed and caught during the uh, first flush of the 
larger storm. The fear is right here, isn't it? Yep. Okay. And they're they're just like concrete pylons. What do they, what do they look like? Just which so, we don't have detail um, yet, right? But we, we haven't finalized the detail, but we you know, in talking to Ceci, we envision that they're going to look similar to the piers uh, supporting the existing kill walkway. Um, which would basically be 18 inch diameter um, concrete columns. Got it. Board members, any 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 questions while we have the uh, the wetlands mitigation plan up? I don't see any. Um, okay. Um, Again, this is helpful, I, and I guess this was this was referred out to EAC at this point, right? So they'll they'll give us recommendations or uh, give us a report. Um, yeah, so they should be at next week's EAC meeting. Um, you know, certainly if you have any questions here, it's a good opportunity to ask them. Um, the wetlands mitigation plan. I uh, just want to make sure everybody's okay with their method of calculation. This would be the first time. A brownfield was used as a wetlands mitigation plan, uh, and it, I think that you know from the planning perspective, I think we're comfortable with that. Um, the net result is obviously the same. It's an area that was largely uh, disturbed, and so converting it to usable space, uh, cleaning up the area, um, is is an appropriate way to mitigate that impact. Um, it, it's not sort of like uh, an instance where you have you know a lovely stream. And a you know meadow, it's it's kind of a a pretty degraded site, and so it's it's you know bringing back that site to uh, to nature largely, and to the availability of the public to to enjoy it as well. So at, at the end of the day, you're going to have a better buffer than you have today. Absolutely, right. A, a cleaner a cleaner site and a better buffer. So we'll, yeah. Okay. Um, Beyond that, I mean, they do have some plantings here. I think that, you know, they've given you some pretty good general numbers on the amount of plantings, sort of the net volume of those plantings. Um, I, I think that the, the landscape, you know, planting plan is something that you're probably gonna want to um, work on through the site plan process. Uh, and I, I think that the, you know, the question about the loss of those trees is something we'll have the arborists take a look at. I'm not sure that, um, you know, we'll necessarily have any final commentary on that as well, considering you're still going to be going through a landscape plan. Um, so, you know, once we hear back from the arborist, uh, we kind of go have that discussion maybe at the next meeting. So do we have a full tree survey on this? We have a, we have a, as full of a tree survey as I think we're reasonably going to be able to get, uh, a large portion of the trees that need to be removed are on a very dangerous ledge. So mm -hmm. it wasn't advisable to send somebody up there to measure them. Understood. Um, so they made estimates of, of those trees. Um, largely, those are trees that probably shouldn't have been allowed to grow there anyways, but we never really maintained the property ourselves. Uh, and so over time, small trees took hold and started growing. Is, is that part of the, the ledge that would then become, like Joe's describing, the exposed stone wall with, with wire mesh? Right. <clears throat> yeah. And um, one of the things that, you know, so uh, this is an yeah, important from a structural standpoint. Uh, sorry, I mean, you, you don't want those trees on that slope anyway. They really shouldn't be there. Yeah. But they'll so, compromise the strength of the support for the slope. Yeah. Right. I, and, and I think it's kind of important to note here that uh, we, we have a bit of a liability right now with those there for us to deal with. The, the, applicant is proposing um, after some negotiation to take that property over and take responsibility for uh, a significant portion of that ledge that we no longer have to be liable for. Uh, so from that standpoint, they do need to remove those trees for safety. Um, and, and that should be a consideration for making the determination of the tree permit. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a very, it's a not minor uh, consideration. Um, considering the fact that it's something that currently we have to be responsible for um, and they're taking over. So we, you know, they need to take those trees down as part of this development. Um, but if this development never happened, we'd still have the problem of 
dealing with a bunch of trees that probably shouldn't be there. Sure. And to that point, maybe it would be helpful on the tree survey just to distinguish, you know, if there's a zone that's the, you know, the trees growing in the rocks, if that could be defined somehow um, in that survey. So as we, we evaluate that, that can be taken into consideration. I, I think that's, that would be a reasonable position. I, I think at the end of the day, it's also, I mean, we, we want to see, we do want to see a lot of, you know, trees replanted. We want to see, you know, we want to see a green site, especially in this part of the village um, where it's come up many times, you know, in, in this board's reviews. Uh, you know that that that's a, a need down here, um, but yeah, we also that's a point well taken. I appreciate that, Jaime. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we did uh, we did to your point identify the area on the slopes where the trees would be coming down and how and uh, how we estimated. I mean, it is sheet seven of nine on our drawing set. Okay, it's, uh, it's seven of nine. Seven of nine on our drawing set is the tree survey and how we quantify trees. <laughs> Is it under the site plan? I'm sorry. Uh, next sheet, I believe. There you go. So that that backwards L-shaped area on the bottom of the site plan or the south side is the area of the steep slopes. Uh, below that, Jaime, uh, basically adjacent to... Uh, Wrapping around the, the building, Jaime. Yep. Yeah, right yeah, this. Got it. Are, are those... You know, okay, so and, and are those calls... Is there a, a corresponding portion of the of the... The tabular survey that that identifies you know, those as trees in that zone. So that is the area that we could not put surveyors due to safety. Right. Um, we did estimate from the ground that there's approximately 95 trees greater than four inches, but that was done as a visual assessment. All right. So those are not included in the in the tabular analysis. No. Okay. Got it. So which which achieves the same effect as what we were just discussing. Yeah. Rich, did you submit um, this particular document as part of the printed plans? Uh, yes, we did. Okay, good. All right. So I'll, um, I'll let the Arbor Snow to come in and pick up a set and then we can go out. So that's something we can have hopefully relatively soon. So we can, we can just kind of yeah, I'll ask him to to you know to take a look as soon as possible and then give us a response and have him come to the next meeting to okay. talk about. It. So excellent. All right. All right. Again, board members, while we're looking at the tree survey. All right. Sounds good. Yeah. So I mean you can see here the bulk of the trees that are going to be removed um, outside of those sort of dangerous trees are as related to the parking structure mm -hmm. uh, where there's currently no building. Um, so. Yeah, well, what's, what is just, I mean, what is the total um, DBH that's gonna be removed excluding the, the slope, the steep slope? Um, just scale to this. Trying to see if we have it here. Uh, nine. 95 trees with four calibers. All right, so there's 95. Yeah, that's just that number. So, do we add that number? Sorry. Uh, if you look on the plan view pointing to that area, there's a call out. Yeah, okay. Down, down page. Yeah. Page. Down? Yep. So, if you keep going down page on the plan view, we have a call out just on the right side of your screen there. Ninety-five trees. This is ninety-five, but that relates to that um, area over here. Correct. No, I was just saying, if, what's the total? You know, if there's, is there a, a sum total yeah. of the, the DBH of the, the trees on the rest of the site? Um, a sum total of DBH we didn't calculate. Uh, basically, what we did is we took the approach of going through all the trees to be removed and looking at them by category. Um, so, for instance, there are certain trees that need to be removed. Um, in order to install the access to the fourth level of the parking deck. 
which is the access that we're giving for the village. We looked at the trees that were going to be removed as part of the creation of the Sing Sing Kill extension. Because again, there's another public benefit that this application is providing. Um, we looked at um, the trees that are going to be removed within the area of the kill and the stormwater basin. Because again, there's another public benefit, you know, that's that's the village had asked us to do. Um, we looked at the trees as part of the brownfield remediation, and then we also broke out the trees that were actually being removed to accommodate the development. Um, when you take away the public benefits and you really look at just the area of our development, um, we're essentially removing seven trees. Those are the yeses? Uh, under the mitigation, yep. Yep, because that area is basically already all developed today. Yeah, yeah. So there's a bunch of trees right here. This part of the plan is also to create a fourth deck, like one of the levels, the top level of the parking garage belongs to the village ultimately. So the access to get to that deck as along with every other deck is at grade. Um, and so this little access aisle uh, is, is part of why a lot of those trees are being removed is in order to create access to the village property. Yeah, I, I think, you know, this will be an important issue and, and it, you know, we, I know I can't speak for other members of the board and there are folks who aren't here. I, th I think it would be important to to look at and understand the total volume of trees that are going to be removed kind of regardless of, you know, you know where they are, brownfield related or not. It just it helps to, to provide a summary for us and an understanding of what what tree what tree mass is going to be lost as a result of this project. Um, you know, we see your analysis and, and you know, the, 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 the kind of the yes versus no column in terms of what what would need to be replaced, um, but we want to take a look at that as well, and obviously to have the village arborist re review that, um, so we can come up with 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 a I think a, a, a project. You know, we want to be we want to be mindful of of what what's going to be lost at the end of this project in terms of trees. Yeah, and so just to be consistent with other projects, um, Rich and Jim, um, the you know the baseline I think is understanding how many trees are going to be removed, the caliber of those trees uh, and the species of those trees, regardless of whether they're invasive um, and just a listing of whether they're dead or dying or um, fair condition or, or, or healthy. Um, getting that baseline would be helpful. And then obviously there are some specific rules around invasive removal and things like that. There is no set um, tree ordinance per se here. So um, you're, you're kind of dealing with past precedent and a lot of the stuff. But that's the baseline that's been used and sort of the, the I think the re, the rationale behind um, you know why you're cutting down those trees I think are, is going to be helpful in making the case for whether or not you need to mitigate or how much you need to mitigate but uh, I think it's still um, to be consistent with it, how everybody else is going to treat that's what you're going to want to provide those details. First so Jaime just just so that everyone's aware of that tree legend on the left side of the page um, which is the survey trees has a description with size and type mm -hmm. as a column of whether it's going to remove or remain um, cites the reason for removal. Um, so for instance, we do have dead trees. They've been identified as a reason for removal. We also went and looked at each tree surveyed and identified those that were invasive species made note of that because we thought that was relevant to the discussion. And all, with the exception of the 95 trees on the slope, all that information is there. Yeah, I think that, I think that all they're looking for is a summary table of those items. So the grand total. Okay. And I think, you know, obviously, you know, where your the trees that are remaining, trees that are removal, being removed kind of as, as a baseline, you know, we're, we're keeping whatever, you know, whatever the DBH you're keeping, whatever the DBH you're removing. Um, and then, you know, you've already got the breakdown within that, the, you know, what you're, you're interpreting to be invasive species versus, you know, native um, in, in the remove column. And then, uh, you know, and then the health of the tree, obviously. So if we can, if, you know, I think you have all the data there. It's just kind of how you're, how you're sorting it and adding it up. In, in fairness to the site, the one thing that we don't have and wouldn't typically get where the majority of the wooded area is, is outside of limited disturbance. So the entire northeast portion of the site um, along the kill is, is where you have your most mature forest. Um, so I... You know, we can discuss that in terms of, you know, this is the area of forest to be preserved, but we would rather not survey that. No, that's fine. I, 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 I don't think we're asking for that. We're, okay. we're talking about where, where, you're, where you're working. 
Okay. Yeah, Rich, stick stick to the distort portion of the site. Yep. And then we'll do something just because I, I you know I don't want everyone to focus on the amount of tree removal on the western site and forget that there's this much forested area being preserved on the eastern portion. You can talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I just have to bring balance to the conversation. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Um, I, you know, I think you've covered a lot of information tonight. We've got another applicant here, so. Yeah, no, I think this is good. Yeah, I, I think just for the board, you know, last meeting um, or your last work session, we did go through um, the EAF and the part two in a lot of detail and gave them a list of things that we're still looking for. Um, from what I've seen, I think they've given us all of those items. Um, we still need, we need the arborist to take a look. From what I, from the discussion tonight, we need we need input from the arborist. We need um, some kind of narrative and some more information with relation to the construction logistics plan. Um, that additional information on the the DBA to the trees being removed, um, the resolution on the fire access issue. Um, is there anything else that anybody thinks we still need? Well, we didn't talk about the traffic study. Did you mentioned um, the uh, floodplain, Linda. Uh, well, have you, re you haven't yet. Yeah, so uh, oh, I, haven't, I haven't reviewed the, that yet. But. Yeah, so the SESI report still needs to be reviewed. And then I, depending on the review of that, that we may need some more information. Right. Yeah, I mean, and as far as the traffic study goes, I can't speak to any real detail on it. Um, unfortunately, Phil's not with us tonight, but he did provide a memo today and you know, in reading through the memo, it, it appears that all of his prior comments and, and concerns have been addressed, uh, you know, related to pedestrian movements, vehicle traffic, um, <laughs> levels of service at various intersections. So I, I think, you know, um, and, and I don't know if we want to hear from John, but uh, I think from a traffic analysis standpoint, uh, that is also in a, a good place from a secret standpoint. Yeah, I did take a look at um, Phil Greeley's memo, and he did say that all his comments had been addressed. Great. Yeah, John, I know that you got that memo about 20 minutes ago. So <laughs> um, do you want to quickly, like, the two-minute rundown? Sure. I, I well, don't think I, there was anything open, but go ahead, John. Well, there, there yeah, is, no, there, basically there. Phil said that it won't have a significant impact on transit. It won't have a significant impact on traffic. Um, he did have one question as to whether we included all of the vicinity developments. I believe we added one that we found up on North Highland <laughs> Avenue. Um, I, I think we've got them. I don't think, frankly, that this project is going to depend on what's being done in other parts of the village. It stands on its own. Uh, and then the one thing that Phil did comment on, which was in our traffic study on page 39 and page 40, with recommendations on page 41, is that the sidewalk along uh, portions of Water Street in the vicinity of the project needs some work. And we have recommended that uh, the sidewalks in front of the project and on the opposite side of Water Street where their, um, their gravel or uh, tar be replaced and that uh, the striping be replaced at the intersections where the crosswalks are. So that's really the only thing he pointed out in his memo. And I think the, most of it was going to get done anyway, because once you go in there with construction equipment, you're going to have to redo the sidewalk. So the applicant will be fixing those sidewalks. Just to yeah, clarify. I imagine, that's so, that's so, a question, right? So we've, we, yeah, we, Rich, Rich has those areas identified in his plan. If you want to pull that up and, and show the board quickly, Jaime. Okay. Uh, Jaime, if you still have our set open, you want to go to sheet. Yeah. Simple. Sheet two of nine, the second sheet in the set. And essentially what we're doing is we're replacing um, all the sidewalks along our project frontage, which uh, go from central water and main um, in addition, we have the crosswalks at the intersection of Central and Water uh, being restriped. Two of nine. You're, yeah, that, that sheet's fine, I mean. Um, All right. So the sidewalk replacement goes just past the E in the word Central Avenue. Um, and you can see starts at the end of our property. Yep. Uh, keep going farther to the right. Yep. Uh, 
right there and then wraps all the way around the project site um, to Main Street to, if you keep going up the hill, we're going all the way around to the existing residence there. Um, again, that was requested by uh, village engineer. And then you can see at Water and Central, we do have restriping as well as the reconstruction of the crosswalks uh, to help try and bring them into ADA conformance as much as possible. However, there are some areas of those sidewalks that are not gonna be uh, able to be brought into full compliance with ADA, just based on existing conditions. All right, um, that works. So I guess by the next meeting, maybe we could go back through that short form, just just only on you know the items that were that we had left open. You know, based on everything that we've looked at tonight, we don't obviously have to go back into the detail that we reviewed tonight, but kind of take take you know what we've learned this evening, apply that to the short form, so we can uh, kind of narrow down the, the part two on the part two. Sorry, yes. Yeah, and just see if you think you now have enough information with the things that we've listed here that are still to come. And of course, you're gonna get input from the EAC and from the zoning board. Right, and we'll have that, we believe, by our June meeting. That's the plan. Okay. Linda, when you were reading that list, was there anything you read before the narrative for the construction management plan and the schedule that would accompany that? I thought there was one item before that. The Arborist. Yeah, got it, okay, thank you. So Jaime will take care of getting that to the village arborist and, and try to get any comments. Very good. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thanks, guys. I think that, that, that'll that do it for tonight. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Um, okay, so I guess we're moving um, on to Snowden Avenue at this point. So Jaime, do you want to just... Tell us where we are, what our what our, our goals are for for this tonight. Um, I think the goal for tonight is to uh, you know kind of start off with seeker questions, start going through the seeker questions, uh, okay. review the EAF, um, uh, sort of start talking about the plan in general. Uh, they've already presented a couple of times, so I don't know. Um, if all the board members are fully up to date with the details of the plan, uh, there, there's a bunch of different components to it uh, because it is part of this Riverwalk plan. They're going to create a new building uh, on the site. Uh, the site has currently got a lot of wetland buffers. Um, it's got small water courses uh, running through it. Uh, it's sort of a weird shaped lot that has a very tiny amount of frontage on um, Snowden Avenue, which is a uh, village street, and then Van Wick Street, which is a village street, but is effectively, you know, a private, you know, access street. Um, so even though the village, I think it's technically in the village's hands, it's maintained privately. Um, they're proposing to put, I think, 40 units of residential uh, apartments, um, sort of on a small footprint with parking underneath, with the bulk of the parking underneath. Uh, in the back, they're going to create a new uh, wetland uh, to replace the wetland that they have uh, disturbed and they're going to create a really long trail uh, to connect it to the Riverwalk Trail in Crawbucky Park, including uh, improvements on the village's property to that. So I, I'm curious, are the board members pretty familiar? Would, would it be helpful to have the applicant kind of give a quick summary uh, with some of the pictures on this or, or do you feel like you're comfortable enough to get started. yeah i think that'll always be helpful i mean just do a quick like five minute recap of everything can, can okay. I just ask, were, were they i apologize did was there a presentation made last last meeting yes no there was, was yeah. it the meeting before um i thought I they went through things at the last meeting i thought they did yeah i think they did yeah it was they quick, quick. they did it they did do a quick thing and then you did um lead agency that's that was my, that was my next question Yes, lead agency was done at the meeting last week. Right. Okay. And they did do a quick summary. Um, okay, so I, I think it's okay to do another quick summary. I think we can, um, yeah, I, I'm just trying to think if we want to do the full, you know, the, you know, the full. Yeah, I mean, I think what, what the goal is, is to try to, if, after the quick summary, is to try to get to the part two questions. Okay. So, 
start focusing on whether or not, you know, there's enough if we're asking about the information that's been submitted and if there's any supplemental information that you'd like to get for it. Okay, that's fair. Um, All right, let's bring them in. Let's let's get moving. All right. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yeah, we do. We can. Excellent. So, Dan, who's with you today? We got Jim Maurer and William DeVore, who I see are already admitted. And there is also uh, Bill Boyce and Bob Stanziella. So, Jim is our engineer, Bill is our landscape architect, and Bob is our uh, project architect. Okay. All right, so I, as was discussed, we did appear last, I guess it was last week now at the regular meeting and we gave a brief presentation. I have the same slides up right now if you want me to just breeze through what we uh, presented last week just to refamiliarize the board. I'm happy yeah, to just the, the greatest hits, that would be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, can you see my screen? So let's go back. All right, so this is the overall layout of the existing conditions of the site. Uh, there are the two water courses traversing through the site from the, the north. The site is approximately 5.92 acres. Uh, there's steep slopes on the eastern edge of it and along the western area of the, the property. Um, it's mostly undeveloped. It, was previously, you know, there's some minor modifications previously, including the construction of a garage, which is no longer there, and some roadways, which are also no longer there. Uh, we provided some environmental information, which we can just breeze over now, but I think it's important just to refamiliarize the board with the existing conditions of the property. And it's really been, you know, maintained in poor uh, condition over the past couple of decades, and it's been left to, you know, essentially become a, a, a trash dump and you know what we're proposing to do is really remediate these existing conditions clean up the entirety of the site and redevelop the eastern portion of the property with a 48 unit multifamily development um, the western portion will be preserved for public um, open space as indicated there is going to be two relocated wetlands areas here is the walkway traversing through those wetlands areas from Van Wick Street. So there's gonna be a few public uh, parking spaces here in the cul-de-sac. There's gonna be a trail going all the way through the property and all the way beyond the property into the village owned uh, property over here, which is the, the Crow Bucky Nature Preserve. And this is um, consistent with a number of the, the village's planning documents and you know, the history of you know, the intentions for this location. So as indicated, approximately 5.92 acres. Uh, the development's gonna be limited to 2.71 acres of the western port or the eastern portion. And then the remaining 3.21 acres on the western portion are gonna be deed restricted for public use. Um, there's the unit breakdown of the 48 units is 16 one bedroom and 32 two bedroom. That's gonna include two affordable one bedroom units and three affordable two bedroom units as required by code. There are some uh, residential amenities, you know, typical things you'd see in a residential multifamily development. There's a pool and fitness center, a rooftop terrace with an area for some solar panels, and then all the pedestrian amenities throughout the proposed walkway, which will be um, available to not only the residents, but also the public who are coming to um, enjoy the, the walk through the property. So again, here's just the overall site plan. Here are a few renderings of the building that's being proposed. Uh, I think it's worth noting that this is without the proposed landscape buffer in between the roadway and the property. Those were omitted from the renderings just to give you a, you know, a visual of what the building is going to look like. But there is be there is an existing um, existing buffer, a vegetated buffer there, and it's going to be enhanced and um, maintained as well. So, a few more. Here's a cross section of 
from Snowden Avenue showing the downward sloping grade towards the property. So it's not gonna look like a giant building from Snowden Avenue. It's gonna be set down into the property and we're really using the, the existing grade and the proposed grade changes to um, help shield the building from view from the public right away. Again, this is the same cross section with some, with enhanced uh, mature vegetation after about five years. So the buffer is only gonna get, you know, it's only gonna improve over time. This is the, the zoning worksheet, uh, the zoning table, which I can just skim through here. Um, here's a proposed planting plan. This is pretty preliminary and we are in the process of preparing a more detailed and in-depth landscaping plan and a tree survey um, of the existing trees and the removal plan. So all that data will be provided at a later date. Again, this is the, the pathway through. There's gonna be a lot more detail coming out as this application progresses of, you know, the details of the walkway and the pedestrian improvements and the overall size and um, dimensions of the walkway itself. So here is a wetland plan showing the, the water courses, um, the existing wetlands and water courses and the blue shaded areas are the existing <coughs> As you can see, we are, you know, relocating a lot of wetlands and wetlands buffers because this is the existing condition and this is where the proposed development is going to be placed. But it's important to note that the existing wetlands and the buffers and the, the water courses are very poorly draining. They're very poorly, veg or they're barely vegetated. They're just not in great condition. So the relocated wetlands are really going to um, improve the existing wetlands conditions at the, at the site, despite our disturbance of part of the wetlands areas. <coughs> we are increasing the amount of wetlands at the site by almost 6,000 square feet. Uh, the mitigation ratio will certainly exceed one to one, to one as required by the code. Um, here's just an overlay of the proposed development with the wetlands and the wetland buffers and the relocated wetlands here on the western portion of the property. And here's a few just visuals of what the wetland, the relocated wetlands are going to look like. It's going to be much more um, ecologically beneficial and much, a much nicer wetland and provide a lot more ecological benefits to the site and community. So here's just large pictures of it and some cross sections of you know, proposed design for some of the relocated wetlands. Um, On-site stormwater infrastructure will be will treat the stormwater for water quality and water quantity. Um, there's going to be an overall reduction of runoff from the property, and it's going to capture and treat the runoff from the off-site sources, which um, we can discuss in more detail. And here are just a few you know, references to the specific planning documents that, you know, support this proposed development and you know specifically call out what's being proposed for this location and this is an excerpt from the the waterfront access and trail plan um, showing what the village intends for this the uh, walkway through the site and the, the pathway so this is really consistent with what the village has demonstrated they they are looking for for this site so we're just really trying to bring that to life and really trying to bring the village what, what it's been you know, considering over the past couple of years. Here are some more details on the proposed pathway through the site and you know, just some visuals of what the, the public improvements are gonna look like. And that is it. I'm sorry if I took too long, I know it's getting late, but I you know, figured it was up, so I may as well walk you through it. So with that, I can turn it back over to the board or Jaime or, you know, we're here to answer any questions. We're you know hoping to get some feedback on the proposal and you know see overall what what the board thinks. Um, yeah, no, I was going to say so. So I, I think you know if there are any kind of initial kind of overall questions or or comments. And again, I, I apologize because I was not at the last full meeting um, that any board members have. I think that's fine. We can do that quickly now, but. You know, unless there's anything you know really kind of overarching, maybe we can just jump right into the part two, so we can work our way through that. That'll be that'll scaffold this conversation for this evening. Okay. So, Jaime, mean, if you want to. Bring All that right, up. I'm going to share my screen. 
so just kind of start from the beginning here. Uh, so first is impact on land. Uh, will the proposed construction? So the quick answer is yes. Um, so I'm going to go through these pretty quickly to try to see if we can just eliminate a few and then we come back on and focus on the ones that are more relevant. So number two, uh, impact on geological features. The proposed action may result in the modification of destruction or inhibit access to any unique or unusual land forms on the site. Um, that's actually a no. Uh, so if you, if you dig deeper into E2G or e, E3C, um, both of those are checked as no. That's from the uh, Yeah. So, you know, there are, if you go- It's looking here, for real unique or, or significant geological landforms. And yeah, the examples they give are cliffs, dunes, minerals, fossils, caves. Yeah, so E2G is a no here. There's nothing like that, right? So E3C, same mm -hmm. thing, um, is a no. So um, that's slightly safe to call that a no there. Uh, impacts on service water. Uh, question is, does it affect one or more wetlands? Uh, that answer is obviously yes. So uh, skip on to the next one. Impact on groundwater. Uh, this is a little more complicated. Um, so the question becomes, is it going to create any new water supply wells? Uh, that answer is no. Uh, water supply demand from the pros actually makes you safe and sustainable withdrawal capacity. And the answer is no. Uh, the proposed action may allow or result in residential uses in areas without water or sewer source. That answer is no. Um, the proposed action may include or require wastewater discharge to groundwater. I'm assuming the answer is no there, Dan. Um, I can go and check the D2D, but I'm assuming no. And we still have Joe on the don't line. believe that is. Yeah. Sorry. So, uh, is that you questioning whether there's wastewater discharge to the to groundwater? Yeah. yeah. That would be a no. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, proposed action may result in the construction of water supply wells located where uh, groundwater is suspected to be contaminated. That's a no. Uh, proposed action may require bulk storage of petroleum or chemical products. And that's a no. Uh, and the proposed action may involve commercial application of pesticides within 100 feet of potable drinking water or irrigation sources. Uh, and that's a no, because there's no drinking water or irrigation sources in the area. So, uh, you know. It's, it's not I like that may be an overall no. I think it's probably an overall no. Yeah. I, so, um, so, impact on flooding. Um, proposed action may result in development on land subject to flooding. Um, so let's see what it says. It looks, I think a lot of these are related to floodplain impacts, Jaime, and there are no floodplains on this property. Okay. All right. So we'll say no. Impacts on air, that's a no. Um, impacts on plants and animals, uh, that's a yes. Um, so I think it's related mostly to just like the cutting down of trees. Right. Um, and those are local issues primarily. Um, so we can come back to that. Um, impacts. Oh, go ahead. That you, we usually fit that under other impacts. Yeah. So agricultural resources, that's a no. Uh, aesthetic resources. So the, the aesthetic resource would be the river walk would be the Hudson River again here. Um, there are no areas where you can actually see the Hudson River. They are gonna be creating stuff to, to add that, but I don't think that there's anything, um, you know, there's nothing here that would mark it as a yes under aesthetic resources. Agreed, it's, it's the Hudson River, that's the aesthetic resource, and this is kind of outside of the- Yeah, and there, there is, I mean, even if you just look at like some of the questions, uh, are there any other buildings nearby um, that are similarly sized. I think that the building right next door is pretty similarly sized. Uh, Dan, do you know how big that building right next door on the other side of Van Wick is? Maybe taller, right? I believe so, yeah. That's the Snowden House, right? Yeah, Snowden House. I think, I think that's, a, I wanna say a seven story building. 
six or seven so, stories. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, not only not only do you not see the Hudson from the site or from the building, but I think conversely, uh, because of the way the topography and the building is situated within it, you won't, I don't think you'll see the building from the river. And, and even if you could, it would be entirely consistent with every other building that's along our side of the river. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, so impact on historic archaeological resources. So let's just check the, the mapper because it might be technically in the zone. So, so, so did we get, and I haven't looked through everything yet, do we have a SHPO letter? Do we have a DEC letter on endangered species? We have not uh, done any SHPO consultation. And I don't believe we have anything from DEC. Yeah, so it is, it's, it's uh, in or contiguous to in a, you know, a district. So it's probably the same thing that affected the 136 Croton Avenue project. It's because right. it was this Yeah, but I, I would recommend going ahead and, and filing in the, the Chris system and try to get, mm -hmm. Something from Shippo? Yeah. So that's going to be a yes. Um, and I think that, you know, as Linda said, that's the, that's the path to getting to the answer on that question. Um, so moving on to impact on open space and recreation. Uh, proposed action may result in a loss of recreation opportunities or reduction of open space resource as designated in the adopted municipal open space plan. Uh, it's not. It's a privately owned property and it's not part of any municipal open space plan. Um, however, uh, they are going to be dedicating a significant portion of the property over to public use as a part of this plan. So it will it, it will result in an increase of recreational opportunities. Yeah, I mean, I think it's something that can go into the, the, the part three, but I, I don't think it needs to be listed here. So I think you can say that's a no. Impact on critical environmental areas. Um, I think it's an critical environmental area, but let me just check. It, it's in the LWRP, I mean, so just it is. by the nature of that, it's it's within it. Yeah. Not it has so, an impact, you know, we could evaluate, but yeah. Uh, yes. it is. Okay. Um, all right. So impact on transportation. So projected traffic may exceed capacity of existing, proposed action may result in a change to existing transportation systems. Uh, you know, I think that it's probably a yes here and you should ask for a traffic study um, to, to assess impacts, particularly on Snowden Avenue. Um, you may wanna consider, you know, sort of any more extensive, you know, traffic study, but it's, it's a project that's roughly half the size of the, the 30 Water Street project, a little bit, less than half, um, but it's going to be sharing the road. It's primarily going to be entry and exit on Snowden Avenue. So you're going to want to get a good examination of that and have it done in context with other projects that, you know, like 30 Water Street that are looking to take place. So agreed. It's very important for this one. Uh, so impacts on energy. Um, uh, pros action may cause an increase in the use of any form of energy. Uh, so I think the answer is going to be no here. Um, so uh, getting to the sort of basis of that, no, um, part one, uh, D2K, um, I mean, would that be a yes with likely no or small impact for all of the sub categories? That's what I'm trying to get to D2K here. Um, I, th I think like we've gone through this exercise a few times and usually there's a threshold. Um, and so I don't think it's gonna rise to the threshold, but let's just see what D2K says. All right. D2, A, B, C, D. Okay. Will the proposed action generate new or additional demand for energy? So they wrote yes, so it's yes. Okay. 
and as we go through the those thresholds are are above they're all within small no impact or small impact yeah yeah so it asks whether it'll utilize more than 2500 megawatt hours per year of electricity um they're proposing that the annual demand is going to be half that uh, less than half that so i mean all of these are going to end up being no or small impact we don't need to deal with that right now but um the property itself um i don't recall do you know what the square footage is dan of the property it's property the entire property yeah like 50 60 000 square foot of the building not not the entire property but the building the the part of the property that's going to be air conditioned bob do you have that answer top of your head it's bob stanziel I mean, I, you know, yeah, I guess give, me, give me two seconds. I'll get back to you. I'll check the plan here. See if I can okay. I think it's around 60,000, 70,000 square feet max. I, I think you're right, Jaime. Um, so impact on noise, odor, and lights. Uh, the proposed action may result in an increase in noise, odor, and lights. I think we can say yes there. Um, and we're going to need to get some details on the construction. So you're going to want a construction uh logistics plan trying to figure out what's going on there uh termination on whether there's gonna be blasting it is going into a steep slope so um i don't know if they've done any um borings yet to determine what the construction methods are going to be um so you're going to want to get those details uh, impact on human health um the proposed action may have an impact on human health from exposure to newer existing sources of contaminants. Uh, the phase one, uh, Dan, I didn't get a chance to take a look at it. Um, do you know if there was any reports back on that phase one? What do you mean any reports back? Is there any contamination on the site? Um, let me... I'll pull it up. So there were some semi-volatile organic compounds found in the soils, uh, but that is primarily, that's it. Other than that, there's just uh, nearby hazardous waste sites off premises and some brownfield sites in the vicinity, but again, not on the premises itself. Okay, all right. Uh, Joe Tremelli, I, I don't know. Did you get a chance to take a look at this? I, I'm not... I don't know if he did, but no, I didn't. Yeah. All right. So we'll just have to take a look at this. 81,000 square feet is a conditioned area. Okay. Yes. Right. Yeah. So we're going to probably, we're going to, you know, want to take a look at this question, the impact on human health um, moving forward. So I'd rather come back to that. Um, uh, consistency with community plans. So the proposed action is not consistent with adopted land use plans. Um, we'll we'll have to go require, through that. Yeah, yeah, it requires variances, um, but it's not like super inconsistent um, with the plans. Um, but it does require some variances. I think so. Uh, Dan, could you uh, just sort of reiterate what the extent of those variances are? Uh, yes, we are still kind of confirming what the variances are. Uh, one of them is the density. So we are permitted eight units per acre maximum. Um, that's with the density bonus, but that, so we would, without any deductions, we would still need a variance because we are about 0 0.08 acres short of being permitted as F48 units but we have to deduct the wetland areas from the total developable, developable area. So that total um, the variance for that's going to um, change depending on the actual wetlands areas on the site. We are also um, in need of a height variance. Again, I think there needs to be some confirmation of the actual variance itself. There was a comment in the College Sessions memo that some additional details of the average grade are um, should be provided to confirm what the actual height is. And there was a variance required for 
disturbance or not providing the 25 foot buffer from water courses that it's required in the CDD district. I think that is it. There was one other question about the building width, which I think we need to address, but I don't anticipate we'll need a variance for that. But again, we'll, we'll confirm that per the Kelly Sessions comments and then the recent memo. Yeah, and, and Dan, uh, I mean, in addition to that, we had some comments that uh, we just couldn't verify one way or the other. Um, just some additional grading or, or data is needed to confirm. I, I don't believe, and they were regarding uh, items such as uh, pavement grades and, and parking space and aisle width dimensions and whatnot. So just some added dimensions and, and details that are planned to confirm that. Uh, I don't think the variances will be needed, but we would just need some additional information to confirm that. Yeah. Okay, so this is going to be a yes, then, uh, the, as you can see here, you know, the proposed action is inconsistent with local land use plans or zoning regulation. Um, you know, you'll have to make a determination about whether it's a small impact or, or a large impact, um, but it is, you know, it's technically inconsistent, and so you're going to want to put that as a yes there. Um, and then consistency with community character. Um, we'll have to look at that. I yeah, think it's, probably a, it's it's probably a yes. Just but we'll we'll walk through the neighborhood, you know, and uh, yeah, you, you usually and, and understand. Yeah, that Snowden's a, Snowden's kind of an interesting hodgepodge, especially um, up in that area. Yeah. Um, so if you look to the right, you'll it's all houses, and if you look to the left, it's it's large properties. So. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's done. Um, okay. All right, so that's kind of where we are now. Um, starting back from the beginning, um, let me just save this while I'm here. So we have um, sort of impact on land. So the, you know, one of the things that you're going to have to do, I, I believe, are, are the slopes at any point, any of the disturbed area, going to be over 25%? <laughs> They are, Joe. I see you nodding there. In the disturbed areas, I believe there's some limited disturbance. Um, Dan, guys, correct me if I'm wrong. I think on the entry drive, you may be traversing some steeper slopes. The the building itself, I believe, for the mid most part, is in areas of lesser slopes. But the um, I believe the entry drive and I'm I think some of the trailway, the connection, would be in areas of steeper slopes. Believe you are correct, uh, Jim. Do you have your steep slopes plan available? <coughs> your slope plan? Yeah, I can share my screen. You want to share? I'm sorry. Did you want to share your screen? Yeah, unless you can pull it up. It's, yeah, um, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So this. Um, gray hatch here. I know they're all gray, um, but it's this medium gray hatch coming down will disturb um, slopes greater than 25%. So the dark gray? The, uh, the, the lighter gray. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you essentially have those, looks like those two bands, the one up uh, towards Snowden where the driveway, the entry drive would loop around into the site, right? And then there's that band that would be generally at the rear of the property between the, I think the rear circulation drive and, and probably the, the wetland creation areas. It might be helpful for the board, uh, Jim, if you could maybe take this, this same sheet and just overlay um, maybe just the, the building footprint and the drive. Yeah, no problem. Just so they could see how it relates to the slopes. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, a summary table quantifying, you know, the amount of acreage on that would be helpful, I think, for making a secret determination also. Um, so just knowing, like, specifically how much acreage of, you know, 15% slopes to 25% slopes and anything above 25% slopes that's going to be disturbed. Um, it, you know, you're going to want similar kind of summary tables for your, your wetlands calculations, which I think you've already done that piece of it. So similar to how you treated the wetland stuff, you're, we're going to need that for um, 
just we need to know it from 15 to 25. Um, and also the, the board has to make a they actually have to make a special determination on anything above 25%. So we need to know the specific um, quantity of slopes over 25% that are going to be uh, disturbed as part of this development. Um, Okay, let's go back to the list. Okay. All right. Um, so the proposed action may involve the excavation or removal of more than a thousand tons of natural material. Uh, you know, it involves construction that continues for more than one year or multiple phases. Um, so you're going to want. I mentioned it again here, you don't want the construction logistics plan. So, you know, how long it, you think it's going to take to actually do this project, uh, what's, what it's going to be involved, steps involved. Um, so I would start working with that. I would highly recommend, um, you know, maybe we set up a meeting with Joe Tremelli and myself um, to go over that construction logistics plan. Linda, I don't know if you want to be a part of something like that as well, but... Um, and then we can kind of go over the details of what you need to do uh, to provide a plan. Yeah, we'd be happy to. Okay. Um, and it's going, you know, it's going to the um, LWRP. So they'll, you know, they'll be able to provide their input on, you know, this section, I, I think on some level as well. So uh, moving on to impacts on surface water. Um, you know, they provided a pretty significant wetlands plan. Um, Jan had some comments. Uh, I guess, Joe, you had them in your memo, right? I believe so. Uh, you know, it, it's, uh, let's see. It's still, it's still, Fairly preliminary. I know, you know, obviously they're they're proposing a pretty substantive wetland creation area, um, but we'll want to get into the details of of the plant things and actually how that's going to function. That's going to be providing some stormwater mitigation as well. So, you know, we'll have to get into the design details with with the applicant on on how that's going to function. Yeah. So I, you know, I I, th I think for that part you know, that's the heart of this section right now is, is figuring out the rest of those details. So, you know, my recommendation there would be to kind of let, let the back and forth continue. Yep. Yeah, no, I think that'd be a helpful conversation to have as well as the construction logistics plan if we can kind of lump the yeah. two conversations together just to see what you guys, you know, run through what be, what's being proposed and if you guys have any recommendations, suggestions, issues. Sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, impacts. Next one is impacts on plants and animals. I know there's been some back and forth with the, with getting the tree survey done. So maybe Dan, do you have an update on that? Uh, because and, and the arborist has been kind of going back and forth with, with your arborist and there was a preliminary work and then I, I think there was Going to be some follow up work, and the follow up was going to include another visit. But I don't know if all of that has actually happened just yet. Don't know if that follow up visit has occurred yet, but I know we are planning to uh, reach out to the uh, arborist to ensure that they're they're in the loop with the update tree survey and the plan to plan to make sure no issues there. Uh, Bill, I don't know. Do you have any further detail there? We can't hear you, Bill. Surprised. Really? There you go. That's interesting. Thank you. Um, my latest update is that the survey is almost complete, at which time we'll reach out to your arborist and take another walk. Uh, there were quite a number of trees that our surveyor had to still pick up, uh, particularly in the buffer areas um, surrounding the area that we're developing. But we wanted a, a full count, so it takes quite a bit of work to survey all those trees. Got it. Okay. So just kind of waiting on that detail to come back in. Um, 
So impact on historic art and archaeological, I think that, you know, uh, as Linda mentioned, getting the application into the Chris system and sort of going from there. Um, impact on critical environmental areas. Uh, you should be going in front of the LWR, the, uh, I'm sorry, the EAC. EAC. So discuss that. Uh, normally the EAC likes to focus on the sort of the wetlands mitigation plan, um, the tree plan, and the SWIP. And so in as much as those three items are not fully completed, Dan, I don't know if you're on the calendar for next week. I think we are. I just checked it, but I yeah. think what you're suggesting is maybe we hold off because I think that would make sense as well. And make sure we have a more fully baked plan before we go before them, if that's... Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll take you off. Yeah, I think that would eliminate the possibility of going back and forth and back and forth between boards. If we can try to go once or twice, it'd be preferable. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the transportation, moving on to the transportation questions, uh, you, um, you know, obviously we're recommending a traffic study here. Uh, are there any particular intersections of interest um, that the board would like to see picked up as a part of this traffic study? I think the, the light, the Snowden light at, at Route 9. Yes, definitely. <laughs> That's, that's probably the main one, I, you know, that's, I think where that traffic will mostly go. We can look at the light at Main Street if people cut across, that's. Mm -hmm. really yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if, you know, Snowden Avenue, you have that exit on Van Wyck, the, the, you know, they're going left and going right. And I'm not sure whether or not you're gonna wanna look at any of that stuff and. Yeah. I think we can look into retaining a, a traffic consultant and then, you know, see what they recommend and see what they think and maybe have some coordination with the village's consultant to, you know, before they start putting pen to paper or anything like that. Yeah, okay. Uh, all right, so the impact on energy, uh, you know, again, it's not gonna meet any of the thresholds of, of, of this question. So if y'all have any specific um, requests for studies, you know, I would say ask them, but I can't think of any, they don't really meet any of the thresholds. I mean, they're at, they're, they, they need energy, but um, they won't be meeting any of the thresholds. Agreed. I don't think there's anything for this scale project that we would need special in here. Okay. Uh, impact on no, noise, odor, and light. Um, so we, we still need the construction logistics plan to have a better understanding of how they're gonna construct this property and that'll get into an answer about some of these other questions. Um, I don't know whether any blasting is gonna be required. I don't really know uh, any of this stuff. We do not have a lighting plan, I don't believe. Uh, so we're going to want uh, a photometric plan. Um, yep. Yep. I think that I think that's that's we need those for this that section that we can. Right. Mm -hmm. And for the impact on human health, I would say you know give some time to take a look at phase one and review that and get back to the board. Agreed. And consistency with the community plans. Um, you know, it's, we need to get this out to the zoning board uh, for their opinion on the variances um, as it pertains to seeker. So I think, you know, I don't believe this was, Linda, was this referred to the zoning board? I thought we did. Um, not that I, oh. I don't believe so. No. Yeah. Oh, okay. I right. We just did lead agency. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. I'm not sure that we actually got referred out. Do we have a referral letter yet from, from Joe? It says DVD basically because we need to get some more information on what the actual variances are. Okay. Yeah. We have so, some before. 
I mean, I, I mean, other than the zoning board, is there? I mean, I'm just looking at this. Is there anything else that we would need from the applicant? Which I, I, I don't think there is. I think, as far as what we would need for secret. No, I mean, I think that we have time, so they're not ready to go to the EAC, and you really need to hear from the EAC before making a determination about this. So I, I think that they can, you know, prepare to go to the zoning board in July. Um, it's, it's too late to get on the zoning board for this month. Um, there's just not enough turnaround time. And so, you know, I would prefer to have them to go in July and, and in July, you know, you'll have feedback from the zoning board on that stuff. Makes sense. Um, and then the question of community character. So I, I'm just going to go through these questions real fast. Yeah. Uh, the proposed action may replace or eliminate existing facility structures or area of historic importance to the community. Um, I, and the answer is no, there's, there is no, there's nothing built on the site. Um, the proposed action may create a demand for additional community services, e.g. schools, police, and fire. Uh, I think I've already requested this, but if I didn't before, Dan, can I get a full um, size set, a, a couple of full size sets printed uh, and sent to us so that we can have a meeting with the fire department to go over this, yeah. um, to have them yeah, review is that, it. Is that a meeting that we can be a part of as well? Oh yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah just let me know how many copies you need and we'll coordinate that. Mm -hmm. um, and then the proposed action may displace affordable or low income housing in an area where there's a shortage of such housing. Um, Doing the opposite. Yeah, yeah, well, it's not an affordable housing project but it is providing affordable housing because of the um, uh, inclusionary ordinance. Um, the proposed action may interfere with the use or enjoyment of officially recognized or designated public resources. Um, it's definitely doing the opposite here. Uh, it's creating uh, trails where currently there, there are none accessible. Uh, the uh, proposed action is inconsistent with the predominant architectural scale and character. Um, I think this is probably a good point to sort of like show what's going on in the neighborhood. Um, that can't not from google man you know say you're somewhere and you show up and it turns out that you're sitting valley you know it'll show up right <laughs> knows where you are always knows All right. Okay, so this is the street. So this is the opposite side of the property. So you can see that there's, you know, houses. The I think the predominant scale of houses here is, is, is essentially this, you know, from one to three story uh, houses on that side of the street. And then on the other side of the street, uh, you have Snowden House. Um, which you can see here. Um, so that's Snowden House. Uh, you can't see how big it is, but it is, you know, it's bigger than the, the proposed property, which is over here in this um, wooded area. Um, then, you know, if you go up in Snowden a little bit, um, uh, if you go this way, uh, some of the next properties over are this uh, commercial property, which has, I believe, large trucks coming in, and it's um, a truck there. Yeah. Ashland, I guess. Which is a private company. Uh, you have the firehouse here, um, and then as you go down towards um, the end of the block, uh, you have more of these smaller homes, um, and then of course Highland Avenue. Uh, 
So going the other direction on Snowden. You have that property there, it's pretty long. Um, then you have more of these homes. Um, and you can see there's you know houses up here. Apparently there's a house on stilts, which I did not realize we had. There are houses on stilts on Snowden Avenue. Okay, good to know. Um, so going down the street here, uh, it's just kind of more of the same on Snowden Avenue. So development as you go down there as well. Yeah, there's this small condo development. And then uh, there are very steep slopes for a section of Snowden. Um, then some more, you know, smaller houses. Uh, there's this multifamily. Um, I think it's like an affordable townhome uh, complex over here. And then once you get down to the end of Snowden, uh, you have a park and um, you have a uh, the, the Varium, the Viria, I don't know how to say it. It's a very fancy name. Um, and then you have the industrial properties in the waterfront. So the, I guess the majority um, of the property, the sort of slight majority of the property is probably, you know, these one to three family homes. Some are attached, some are detached. Um, maybe even just the plurality, you might call it. Um, uh, there are some, you know, large buildings immediately adjacent to the property. So uh, right next to the property um, on that side of the street, uh, it's, is that a is that a is it a T zone on the other side of Snowden? I think South so. Park? I think so. I don't have access to my GIS here, but I believe so. Um, this side is the CDD zone. Right. So it's a different zoning district. Yes, it is the T zone across Snowden Avenue. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. I mean, uh, what is the second swath of, of land that's on the other side of the firehouse? Okay, that's a, that's a good question. So we actually got a letter in the mail, not to the planning board, but to the board of trustees about that project. Okay. Um, it is my guess. And so you can see there, there's a little bit of grass here. So the the property here this is the this is the aqueduct trail mm -hmm. and then this is just the driveway to the firehouse uh, okay. um, the secret of the firehouse is that half of their parking lot is in the uh, property behind it right so half of their they've are, they've built onto the neighbor's property that that property is a very large property it's come before it it started the process of you know going through the in the eis and it didn't get anywhere, right? So it sort of like fell off the side of a cliff and we have, you know, they come back a couple of times to talk about the project. Um, but there was opposition to that project because of its access to Beach uh, Road and various other reasons, some of which pertain to this property, some of which do not. Um, and so we got a letter saying, you know, you know, expressing a lot of concerns, but it wasn't about this property. It was about the adjacent property. And it wasn't addressed to the planning board. So we didn't send it to you because it's not really relevant at this point because it, they're confusing the problem. Now, if we get a letter, you know, and they say, change my address and then we'll send it to you. Okay. Um, but so there's not, not an active project proposed for this parcel at this time. No, it's not active. It's not active. I mean, it's not, it's, it's, it's on life support, I imagine. By the developer, but we don't have any formal application. Um, I have, you know, seen um, some plans of an of like a concept that they never move forward with, uh, and I think that was I, I want to say a year ago, so maybe more. 
So I have no idea what's going on with the property. I don't even know if it's in the same ownership. Base. I assume it is. I believe the same family's owned it for like 30 years. Um, but it's not active. And it's definitely not, there's no official application. So. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, all right. Yeah. I think that's, yeah, no, I, I think that's helpful. I mean, um, I think we've kind of gone through it. I, I, does it. Is the applicant clear in terms of what we're, we're looking for in terms of additional information as we do this review? Yeah, yes, I yep. think we have a few new items from this evening as well as the, the recent Keller Sessions memo, which we're you know, actively working through. But you know, we know we've got our work cut out for us. So if there's any comments or so, other suggestions or thoughts, you know, generally we're, we're all ears. We're happy to you know, continue working with the board and the village to you know, bring this project to light. Board members, any other, any other questions or requests while we're, while we're still here? Not at this time for me. Not at this time, thank you. Okay. All right. Um, I mean, is there anything we missed or? Okay. I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, we've got, we've got a lot of work ahead of us. Um, they've got a lot of items to get back to us. And, you know, we've, we've got meetings to take place with the zoning board and EAC. So, um, you know, I, the one thing that I would sort of consider is that if they're not going to go to the EAC this month and they're not going to go to the zoning board this month, um, it may be beneficial to, to have them come back in July um, after they've gotten all those materials, gotten all the responses. Um, they'll still be, you know, an opportunity to do work, but I, I'm not sure how much benefit there is to have them coming back until we've closed the loop on some of those things. I don't want to deny them the right to come here, um, but I, I also don't want to um, take away your time um, if we don't have final answers on some of those items. Um, and, you know, so we'll you, you yeah. be coming for an update essentially. Yeah, is that something we can revisit, you know, in a few weeks once we have a better handle on where we are? Because if there's something noteworthy to report, it might make sense to come in just to, provide a short update but yeah you know, I don't I don't think we're gonna have all these boxes checked off before then so I would anticipate we might want to we might want to adjourn the meeting and you know allow you guys to free up a little bit more space on your agendas I know you guys have had some long agendas recently so makes sense go okay. all right very good well I think that can do it for tonight um thanks everybody and uh so we can we can release uh, the applicant. I just just a reminder to to the board members. I guess that our next meeting will be um, in person in June. So just kind of remember that, and you know, as you're you're planning for uh, it's been it's been a long, <laughs> it's been a long time. So um, and and I guess do we do we have? I, I was looking at my calendar. Do we have our next planning sessions? I know we we scheduled a bunch. Do we have us plan up? That but you guys are all here, but for the folks who who didn't remember or, or uh, just didn't have this in their calendar, we should just make sure that for future work sessions, um, that, you know, I don't know what we have in the calendar moving past this month. I know we we scheduled a, a a handful, so we should look at what we need, and I'm assuming those will also be in person moving forward. So yeah, there there is you know a slight chance that the governor could extend again, but I'm not counting on it. Yeah, fair enough. So we'll. We'll, we'll, we'll keep that in mind. I'm, I'm working under the assumption at this point that 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 this is probably it, but um, who knows? Yeah, my yeah. my other boards have been in person for months, so <laughs> we went back once in person like a year ago. All right, and, you uh, had to. You had you last July. You would have had to. Yeah, um, and that was that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, everybody. Well, on that note. Have a wonderful night. Good night, uh, everybody. Thank you. Night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Bye. Goodbye. Have a good night. Night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.